Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Earl Beatty, and welcome wherever you're coming from. I'm coming from Washington State here, where, thanks to uh, the coronavirus and COVID-19, we're all working from home. So I'm glad you can join me from wherever you're at. And as you may notice, it's Bow Tie Tuesday. Bow Tie Tuesday, one of my favorite days out there, and because it allows me to wear my bow ties. However, if you come back and see me again on Thursday, you won't be seeing the die. So welcome to this. Uh, this is how user stories can help support work in distributed teams. Um, what we're going to look at here is how we can use user stories to help us break down stuff. So a couple things before we get started, though. Uh, one is that this is part of the Constructs Lunch and Learn program. We started trying to help out people back in 2009 when the dot com crunch happened. In the dot com crunch, a lot of people were out of work, and we thought, you know, we could have public seminars to help them up their skills, increase their game a little bit. Um, that worked out pretty well, and a lot of people got a lot of benefit. It. So here now during the coronavirus, we thought we'd do this program again. But this time, instead of being our public, since we can't really gather together anymore, we were going to hold it in our virtual session. So we've got these one hour lunch and learns. We also have available to you, um, if you so choose, some additional virtual learning opportunities you might want to look at. Uh, but one of our overall goals in trying to do this lunch and learn and do this uh, virtually is trying to make sure that as a community of software professionals who are often either working remotely or even working from home, that you have a chance to start saying, hey, there's a bigger world out there. There's a community that I could possibly be a part of. And so one of our goals is to help be a spirit to help create that community. We're not going to be the community, but we can help create it and get people to saying, yes, we can form into virtual communities over this. And we're going to keep this going throughout all of the rest of March and next month into April. And then we'll reevaluate depending on what the coronavirus does after that. So be sure to tell anyone else you think might be interested in this um, and the topics coming up. You can find them all down here in the corner at constructs slash uh, lunch that you can start saying, yeah, these are programs that are worth sharing with other people. But so uh, a little bit of tech talk here as well, lunch and learn tech. Uh, if you look up in your uh, interface, there should be a Q&A button. Feel free to submit questions at any time. Use the Q&A button. I will answer these questions at the end of the presentation uh, generally, but uh, feel free to submit them as we go along because as in all these technologies, I'm about a minute or so ahead of you. So uh, if you wait to the last moment to submit your question, I might not notice it was coming before I thought uh, we were done. So be sure to submit them as, as you come up and put them in there. And when you do submit them, you can actually pause the presentation. Uh, uh, one of the interesting things about Microsoft's uh, uh, team live events is that you can pause it, submit your question, and then start playing again so you don't have to miss a thing. Um, and then I will still answer the questions at the end. So you can pause the presentation. For those using the web interface, be careful because your space bar, if the web interface is the active window, will pause the presentation. So if, you're, if it's paused, you're not sure why, check to make sure that it wasn't paused. Also, if you heard something, you want to hear it again, you can slide back in the presentation. You can go say, what was that he just said? And hear it again. And again, because you can control the pace and timing of this and you can consume it as much as you want. You need to stop and talk to someone, pause it, have the conversation, and pick it right up where you left off. Just be sure to submit those Q&As probably before 12.30 uh, Pacific time uh, so that I can get them in here. All right, so let's talk about what we're going to talk about today. What are the courses we're going to have uh, in our lunch today? Well, we're going to have to start out with some user story basics because to help us understand how they can help us on distributed teams or even working from home, we have to understand some basics. And then we're going to start leveling them. Now, one of the interesting things is that Agile out of the box only gave us sort of two levels, the epic level and the fit level. And we're going to have to do a little bit more than that to start talking about how these things work. And then we're going to start seeing how the conversations work in a distributed way, how we can make total advantage of the fact that we are working from home and make that really, really effective. And then we'll talk about how we decompose stories for a distributed team so that the stories can help us queue up the work. And then we'll digest it all with some summary and some key points about how that turned out. So that's our agenda or our courses for today. 
Um, and hopefully that sounds like an appetizing menu to you. So let's look at some user story basics. And here I want to sort of frame this so that we can understand how user stories kind of work in the real world. So we can start seeing how we can then use them for our distributed or work from home kind of world. So when we think about a user stories, we have to think about actual stories, not the paper yet, but actual stories of people interacting with whatever we're building. See, what we're building here is this big block of magic. This big block of magic, as far as the world is concerned, what happens inside this big block of magic is totally amazing, credible stuff. I like to think it often as ninja squirrels doing things for me that are super fast and super ninja because, frankly, squirrels are ninja. So if my squirrels or ninja are doing a great job, wow, wouldn't it be great if they can come back in there and really do something cool? And so what we see are these interactions is that these different people have these ways they want to interact with it, whether they're people or they're systems, right? So here's a system interacting with it. It says, I want something out of it. And it may interact with it two or three different ways, right? And this person may interact with it two or three different main ways. So all these are interacting with my big blocks of magic. How I do it is up to them, but they want something. Like they want to get, I need info, might be what this one needs, or I need to send you a status or a state. Right? I need to get the state out of that. All these are things that probably interact with this. So if you got that stuff down, that's really, really handy. So when we think about user stories, we have to first start thinking about the stories of interaction with our big black box of magic. And then what the user story, when we think about your story, is now it's just a template that we're going to use to sort of capture what are these interactions like the state here or the info here, right? What are these interactions? And so we've got this card thing, right? That's what we were, this was what sort of is based on. And I think it's really helpful to think about a physical card when you think about the user story. Because the physical card has attributes that we can start talking about, but most important is the attributes of having a front and a back, right? With a front and a back, we can start saying, wow, there's, there's a lot of content here that I have to actually capture to say I have a full user story. So let's break down that content a little bit here. The first part of this content is on the front of the card, let's look at the front, is, is the name. And the name is in this verb noun format. This verb noun format is familiar to lots and lots of people. Do X, right? Do something, do a thing. Because this verb noun is sort of the action that you'll see in things like activity models and use cases, right? All those have the same verb now thing. It's a very popular model when we're trying to understand. Basically, this is what we're going to be talking about functions, right? Something someone does, a function of some kind. And the verb noun in a use case is just enough to help us say, where are we? Where does this go? Right? So we can quickly find it. We don't have to read every description to find it. The verb noun or the name here has helped us to find this thing really, really quickly. But by having that clearly verb noun, it gives us a clarity about what we're really talking about. So the use case has a name in a verb noun format. The next thing on here is the textual description. Now, when it first came out, this was supposed to be a free form text field, but we wanted to talk about those interactions, those black boxes of magic. And too many people were talking about what was in the black box, what was in here, not the but not the interactions and so to help them out we try to put in this textual description right this this as a i want to so we could describe these interactions as a whoever this is i want to do this thing right here right that's what we're trying to capture in that textual description so as a actor consumer outside of my black box i need this from your black box how you go about doing it i don't care but i need this thing so we've got two key pieces of information here. We've got who that actor is, and we got what thing they're doing. Also captured in, as we saw earlier, in that name, enter a defect, right? So that's on the front of the card. And also on the front of the card is some sort of description or sizing thing. And the sizing thing changes slightly based upon what you're doing estimating. Very early on when these are what we often call epic, 
an Epic being it's too big for a sprint, right? This size is going to be in t-shirt sizes. I like to use t-shirt sizes, small, medium, large, extra large, right? Only when I get into the fit sizes, when we've decided it actually fits in sprints, then I go into the Fibonacci sequence. Uh, 5, 8, 13, right? So the size estimate here is appropriate to where we are in its decompositional life. And we'll talk about breaking down these stories a bit in more in the area. But we usually want to give it a size so we get a sense with that verb noun and that size, we can start saying, ah, does this sound like something I want to work on sooner than later? So that's the front of the card. Those are the key things we typically see on the front of a physical card. And this is stuff that's usually captured in a tool like Jira or Azure DevOps. They're pretty good at capturing the front of the card. But there's also a back of the card. And here's where I see the tools kind of falling down a little bit because there's two main fields on the back of the card that things we want to capture. And the first one is the notes. Notes about things we want to remember when we pull this card up. And one of the note things that we really often we need to capture are design ideas about ways we actually might want to solve it inside the black box. Because it turns out that human beings love talking about the inside of the black box, about how to build things, how to do solutions. That's what they're really excited about. And so if you are going to listen to them, you want to tell them, I'm hearing you. And so you want to capture what they're saying. But it doesn't really belong in the function that's outside the black box. So if you want to talk about inside the black box, you need to sort of say, OK, we got to put that somewhere. And the user story gave us in the notes section things we want to remember. So notes section, one of the key fields on the back of the card. Another key field, though, is the acceptance criteria. The acceptance criteria says, when I do that thing on the front of the card, right? when I have that function I'm doing, how well do I have to do it to say I've done it in an acceptable way? And these are going to be often what are called the illities or something like that, like availability and usability and maintainability and extensibility and portability and all these kind of illities kind of things. There's lots of these potential illities out there. In fact, there's an ISO standard 25010 um, that has in its sort of sort of starter kit about 31 of these illities. So there's lots to choose from, although only about five to seven really matter at any given time. Ones that really stand out. So we don't have to do all 31 of these things. We only have to really name five to seven that say here's the one that really matter. But what we do these things, these turn into sort of in overall the acceptance test. When I do that function, how do I know I did it in an acceptable way? So that's our card our card that has a front and a back. Because together, all this makes up the user story. A lot of people get confused thinking only this part makes up the user story. That's just the description. You need all this content to be a user story. Other than that, you really have missed the boat a little bit. But what this isn't, this isn't a specification. This isn't all the content you need to actually build something. This doesn't even approximate a specification. Because when you look at a requirement spec, it has lots of other things in it. It's going to have things that say things like, who are the users? Tell me about them, right? What are all the things they're doing? How smart are they? Where do they come from? What skills do they have? What's their demographics? All this kind of stuff about who they are. And we'll make capture those in terms of personas, right? That's going to be in this larger kind of spec, which the user stories have nothing to say about at all. There's going to be stuff about the environment. When things happen, who, uh, what's going on around it? What kind of things? Is it noisy? Is it quiet? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it really, really busy with other activities or is it pretty much a standalone kind of thing? What's going on when they do this thing? All that's in the requirement spec, which is never in the user story. And then there's also things like uh, the stuff that happens before and after. Any other kind of context things that go in there. All that's in the spec, again, that isn't in there. If we had to say what is in the spec that's kind of like our user stories, there's going to be what I sort of put in this little red section here. These are sort of statements which we classify, classi classically call the shall statements. 
the system shall this, the system shall that. That is probably getting as close as to equal to what we see in the user story. Then as we see in the spec, probably as close as we get. However, there's a lot more to a spec that isn't just the system shall statements. It's all those users, personas, environment, before and afters, uh, interfaces, all this other stuff that isn't just the statements that the system shall. All that context gives it really, really good life. And so this is really, to me, the liberator. Knowing that my story is, is not approximate to a spec, that says I can treat this different. I can say this kind of thing is something that I might call a working document, right? Over here, that thing's a working document. It's something that I can use and I can change whenever, right? Because it's just a working, it's not the spec. It's not a highly important thing. It's something I'm using to understand and move it. So I can change it whenever I want. And at some point, I'll put it into my repository. My repository is the place where the record here is. Here's where I want to have change control and all that kind of stuff if I want to do that, right? Some people want to create a repository, like my medical devices. They have to have a repository of all the final requirements built. But maybe my startups don't have a repository and they don't want to do exchange control. But that's not to say that the story is the working document. The story over here, right? Here's the story, right? And over here would be a spec or something like that or some other kind of document you created to make that happen. So given that, this is what gives me to, to the excitement to say, this thing on the left, I can do a lot of things with it. And what do I want, I want it to do with it is help me sort of organize my work. Right? I want it to help me organize my work, and that's where it's become a powerful tool to help me when I'm distributed and I'm working from home. Because all I'm going to do is adjust, saying, you know what? We were organizing our work for having a co-located team. When we were all sitting together, that means things could be a certain size and a certain understanding. But now that we're splitting apart, I want to organize my work differently. And knowing that this is a working document, I can use it to organize my life radically differently. So. That's really powerful. So knowing it's not the spec is my key tool. And of course, we're going to put that into the backlog. And one of the things we're going to do now, because it's not the spec, I just want to have just enough in the story to help me do a few things. And the idea is was to keep this lightweight so I can just list it, prioritize it, and roughly size it. That was the goal of the actual user story. It wasn't there to be instructions of how to build this thing. That belongs somewhere else. It was just enough so I could put it on the backlog and sort it, right? So I could say, oh, this one sounds like it's more important than that one because I know it roughly its size, which size sort of equals in a certain way cost. And I can see sort of what it is. And is that more valuable at that cost to do something else? That's all it was meant to do. So knowing that, I start saying, ah, what I really want to do is just that. I want it to organize my work. So finally, how did that turn into actual work? Well, we took that card back off the product backlog. It hit the product owner, and the product owner gave us all the rest of the stuff that was typically in that spec, all that context, who the users are, where are they, what's the environment going on. All that was in a little thought bubble in their head, right, as they talked to us saying, here's how this thing is actually going to work. And this is also, in a sense, kind of powerful, because on Thursday, on Thursday, I'm going to speak about how the Pro pull this off in a distributed context. Today, we're just focusing on how to make these help us distribute the work correctly. But remember, these are actually a work organization tool more than ever be a spec because we need all this stuff here to be the spec, right? That's how it was designed to be. So we're going to look at it from a slightly different angle. So first thing to realize here as we talk about how to use this on distributed teams is to say this is a work organizational tool, not a specification or even an instruction for the team to use to build this. Okay. So user story levels. How do we actually sort of deal with this to make sure that we've got the right level going? Because it, it really helps to understand because I think the levels here help us sort of have these conversations. Which ones do we have to have together 
and which ones could be a little differently. So I think there is certain levels of user stories. And what the thing can do in user stories when you have user level is you can decompose them on the functional level. So I'm going to focus on the front of the card here, if you will, right? The do the thing, right? We got the verb noun and we got my little description here and we got the size. And there's one level I like to start with, and I call that level the Berry level, B-E-R-I, Berry, beginning and reason for interaction. Because what the Berry level is trying to do is trying to go back to this picture here, excuse me, and say, gosh, what is this interaction right here? What is that interaction that someone wants to use my black box for, right? Because they want to use my back box, then I have a Berry. If something has a beginning, a clear start, an end, and a reason why they want to interact. One of the examples I love to use is a cash machine. Cash machines are actually any kind of, of interface to get your to your bank account. One of the things I want to do is manage my money. Managing my money is really a valuable thing to me. But managing my money is, might be a great reason to interact with a cash distribution or a cash dispenser, but it doesn't have a clear beginning and end. It keeps on going. And so it doesn't meet my very standard. Withdraw money, deposit money, that seems to have a pretty good or understandable beginning and end. And that's why I would go up to like a cash machine. I want to withdraw money. Entering my PIN, entering my PIN, pretty clear beginning and end, but that's not a good reason for me to interact with a cash machine. Right? I don't go to a cash machine saying, hmm, I want to enter my PIN. I'm all done. Let me get out of here. Right? That's just not how it works. So I want to do things that have sort of this berry flavor to them. Beginning and reason for interaction. From that one, because that's to me, that's really, really where value is, right? To me, value is the berry. That's why someone wants to interact with this thing. The consumer desires to do what you're doing. I want to withdraw money. I want to check into an airline flight. I want to send my state as says a sensor. That's a berry for a sensor. I wanted them to send my state and to receive it. That's why I want to interact with what you're building. So the berry to me is this value level. And so I'm going to put this down here at a level. I'm going to call this the berry level. Now, when you have a berry, there might be 18 different ways to withdraw money. I could withdraw money at a cash machine. And even at the cash machine, I could withdraw it from checking. I could withdraw it from savings. I can cherry, choose different amounts. Or I can go to a teller. Or I can use an app. All these different ways are different pathways of achieving that same berry. And I call this my value path level. In a sense, the value path is one instance of the berry, one way of achieving that goal. How can I check into a flight? I can check into my airline flight a dozen different ways. Each one is one value path, one particular way of trying to achieve that. Send the state of my sensor. I can send it as a message. I can send it as a pulse. I can set it as a gate change. Right? There's lots of different ways I could potentially do that. Each is a value path. The value path level is just one way of trying to achieve that berry. And this is really cool if you're thinking about distributive work because now you can start saying, hey, I have one particular way I can build this and we can start breaking that down because every value path has some sort of decomposition to it as well. So once we got the value path, then we can start saying, ah, there might be steps on that path. Just like any pathway, here's the first step, here's the second step, here's the third step. So breaking it down by workflow. I may be able to break it down by types and come up with different value paths for different types. That's perfectly fine too. But once I start with a value path level, and there could be multiple value paths, each value path tends to break down into steps. And steps, cool, cool enough, can break down into sub-steps, and sub-steps can break it into sub-sub-steps. For example, if I said I'm a toast lover and I like to make toast, one value path might be toast uh, whole wheat bread, sliced whole wheat bread. That's different than the value path of saying toast a bagel or different than the value path saying toast a waffle or frozen waffle. My value path is toast um, whole wheat bread. What might be the steps on that one? Get bread, insert bread, heat bread, remove bread. What might be the sub steps of get bread? Find bag, open bag, remove slice, close bag, put bag away. Right? So all these can continually break down. And this is really powerful if you're trying to distribute it to the team. Because one of the things we have to do is we have to get down to the right level which the team can actually consume. But first of all, knowing that you have these levels can really start help us start saying, where do we have to have conversations as a group and where do we have to have conversations together? 
So that's the next thing I want to look at here is how do we actually use these levels to help us understand story conversations. So remember, we started out here saying this story, the, the user story, this thing over here is not a spec. It's not everything we need. We need all the context from this person over here. And that's why all the agile gurus have tried to tell us that this thing, the user story over here, is just a placeholder for a conversation. Because all the context, all the richness, all the understanding came with that context from the product owner. But one of the problems with distributed courses, is this context gets really, really hard to do. And I'm be looking at Thursday, different ways we can have that conversation. But here I'm looking at saying what conversations actually need to take place. I think there are very level conversations in value path. And on these levels, I think we have to act as a whole team to really have these conversations. We really can't break this apart. We're going to have to sacrifice a little bit and get on the horn at the same time or come up with some other ways to try to act as a whole team to have these conversations. Because really, when you think about these top level conversations, these whole berry conversations, we've got to get these pretty darn well done. So I want these as a team, because this is really the big picture. This is what's delivering value to the customer. And I need to understand that as any team member so I know how to build the right thing. I need to know what it is to say, what's good about this? And the berry and the value path level give me that. And I feel strongly that if we do very well at conversations at this level, really do well at this level, that means underneath these levels, the berry level and the value path level, if I do well at these levels, this will empower people underneath me to work more independently, which is going to be really, really important as we get more distributed. We could have pulled this off a little bit when we were all together and not do this well, but we've got to do this well to empower and allow people to work more independently underneath us. Because we look at the levels underneath us, these can be smaller conversations in terms of smaller in terms of smaller subgroups working in as far as even down to the individual level, or maybe two people sort of pairing up together over a uh, uh, FaceTime or FaceTime, how Apple of me, uh, a Teams meeting session or a Zoom session or something like that, or Google Hangout, right? We can have smaller conversations down here if we did that uh, area up front, because if we understood the area, we can build these in such a way that we don't violate the top levels, right? Because remember, if my value path is toast brown bread, and I say I need it to be evenly brown, and my acceptance criteria is that it's evenly brown, and it takes less than three minutes, and that it doesn't you know, cost me more than X amount of electricity to be able to do this, whatever I build the stuff bubble has to satisfy that higher level. I can't build something down here that violates the thing up here, right? I have to say, ah, oh, I, since I know where you're going, I can make sure these steps down here actually meet where you're trying to go. That's really cool because now I don't have to bring everyone into that conversation down here. I can have the smaller conversation because I have a clarity about this top level that says down here, I know what we're talking about. So smaller conversations at the lower level, team conversations at the top level. And who's leading those conversations? Well, I think those two top level conversations, we're going to be seeing our product owner right here. Our product owner is the leader. Now, the whole team hopefully is in that conversations, but the product owner is taking charge of them. They're saying, ah, here's what reality is. I'm finding what the answers are. I am the expert at these levels, right? Because up here, we should be up here at the top pretty, in a sense, tech free, right? These conversations are fairly tech-free. That is, they are logical. This is what they have to do. No matter how we do it, we need to accomplish this. And one of the beautiful things is that tech-free conversations are pretty easy to do because we've been doing a lot of these functions for a long time. I like to hold up my iPhone 8 and say, yeah, it's outdated, right? My iPhone 8 here. Here's my iPhone 8. Hello, iPhone 8, right? It's totally outdated. But there isn't a function on it still that hasn't been around for 500 years. Talk to another person, play a game, determine my location, time, and space, play music. We've been doing that for a long time. And so at the Barry and Value Path level, we can still talk about here's what they need to do. They need to play music. But they want to play music, they want to play more songs. They want to have more songs available to them than they've ever had before. 
They want 10,000 songs. Well, hauling around an orchestra is not going to be very good for that. So I'm going to have to invent a device that allows me to carry around 10,000 songs. A value path, I want to play music. And accept this criteria, I want to choose among 10,000 songs. Right? That's really cool. So the PO who's interacting with all those stakeholders out there is going to be the leader of that conversation. When we get down to the bottom part, here's where tech really starts coming. It's tech impacts. Okay. So down here, we're going to start seeing tech really take over because these are steps saying, ah, I'm going to solve the PO here to make sure I'm not doing something stupid, but the tech's going to sort of lead the conversation down at these levels. And this is really cool because now I can start seeing that I can have those smaller conversations when I have smaller amounts of my dev team actually working that conversation. So here's where tech's really going to drive that thing going forward. They're going to have those tech uh, discussions and they're going to say, as long as I can still meet what we need to do up here at the value path level, we can sort of, in a sense, almost build what we want to because as long as I satisfy that top level, we're good to go. So the tech will lead this conversation. And what's also cool about this is that if we think about conversation frequency, these top level here discussions are usually in sort of the, I have to have a few dozen of these, right? And maybe it's a two dozen, maybe a three dozen, but simply it's not a lot of them. I don't have to have them as frequently as I do the lower level, because down here, there are literally hundreds of discussions down here that we have to have. And I want to be able to have that PO since we're all distributed. I don't want to have to have these large PO discussions more than a handful of times because I want the whole team there. Whereas down below with these more frequent discussions, how are we going to solve this? How are we going to do this? Right? Because these down here at the bottom are down here, remember, are sort of have a lot of tech in them. Here's where the dean can really take over and drive a lot of those conversations themselves. Unfortunately, what I see in too many organizations is that we don't do those top conversations very well. And we try to bring the PO down here, down here to those member hundreds of conversations down here. And this is where, yeah, if we were co-located and we had a PO that was pretty good, we might be able to pull this off. But once we get distributed and we're all trying to work from home, this is gonna fail pretty quickly because we have to have the entire team here now and that means seven, eight people. We have to get the PO who might be in a different time zone altogether, right? This really starts to fall apart pretty quickly. And so this is a uh, collapse of a good distributed conversation because without this top level up here, we're going to fall apart. So the bottom line is that for a good, healthy distributed conversation, we want to have the team really do well on that top part so that we can distribute that bottom part and have people work more independently, right? Because down here, yeah, this is a one, I'm, I'm gonna be honest, right? This is when distributed, this might be a painful, whoops, went backwards. This might be painful because some of them might have to get up in the middle of the night to make this happen, that do well here, it might be painful. But generally, it's gonna be better than just moving on. Oh, that's where the painful showed up. All right, so how do we actually decode these user stories for distribution? Well, we're going to do the same process we always said, right? So if we could pull this off, if this was the optimum distribution, we would give one value path to one team that fit in one sprint, right? This is the optimum distribution because if I have a story that has this value path, remember the value path is one way of delivering the berry, right? We still have our berry out here somewhere. And this is just one way of delivering that berry, beginning and reason for interaction. Because if I deliver that, I says, yeah, you can do one way. You can check in one way. You can toast bread one way. You can get your money one way from a cash machine, right? So a value path is just one way and it delivers that value. And then we can add another value path, another value path. So if I can give one value path per team, per sprint, that's the optimum. In fact, let's even make it more optimum in a sense. If I look and say I could do that in less than half the duration of my sprint, this is really cool because this is what I use for my particular fit rule. I use the 50% to come up with my rule because I want to be able to say, yes, I can easily get this done in a sprint. That's what I really want to be able to do. So the 50% is a good sort of marker here. How do I make sure I get it done? But this is optimum but sort of reality comes in differently. Adelaide says, you know what? 
I'm looking at that 50% duration, my fit rule here. I'm looking at the team. I'm looking at that value path. And you know what? It's too big, <laughs> right? That value path is too big for spread. So we have to break it down. We take it down to the next level down. We break it into the steps. So we're going to have to break this down to the step level. And then we're going to ask the same question again. Can we fit this in the step level in the 50% duration? And if we can, perfect. This is a good fit here. And we give it to the team. So far, so good. Now, here's where we're going to run into something more interesting. What if I'm now distributed? I only have two people maybe working together or even one person. I'll even cross out this person and say, I'm all by myself. How low do I go? Well, I have to look at that same story again and say, does it fit in my fit level? And I'm probably going to say, yeah, it's too big again, right? Where it could have fit maybe if my team was co-located, but we're not co-located anymore. And I want to clarify the discussion. So we're going to have that decompositional work, which we do in backlog refinement, right? This is a true backlog refinement. We try to do that as a team. And again, on Thursday, I'll talk about how I try to do that when we're distributed and really can't talk at the same time. But the, but the bottom line here is that we want to start saying, how do we break that down? As a team, we understand that breakdown. It's still going to steps of the workflow. Like I went to opening the bread and I can then break down, how do I open a bag of bread? Well, I can open a bag of bread by grabbing the twist tie, taking off, unraveling the bread. So I, I can keep breaking this down. And this is too big, then we'll go to a sub-step level. That's good for the two people or the one people. We got to break it down till it fits. So the rule here is basically on my distributed refinement rule here is going to be refine the near term backlog until it easily fits distributed team sprint. So this is what we're looking at here. We're going to say we're going to keep breaking this down until it fits into where we're distributed, which may mean we have to decompose into the sub, 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 sub step. Now, this works when. Let me go over to my doodle board here a little bit, right? As we're taking stories, we're breaking stories down into smaller stories, right? This works if we, first of all, stayed in user story land. This does not work if we went into what I call solution stories. A solution story basically is a design hidden or disguised as a user story. A user story says, as a user, I need to accomplish this thing outside that black box of magic, right? We had the black box of magic, and there was a user over here that wanted something. That's what the user story says. If I start describing what's inside this black box of magic, like you'll build it this way, that is the solution story. And this is really hard because people talk in terms of solution stories. So as a user story, this works when I break it down because this, I can always keep breaking down truly functional bits. It's usually not very hard. No one has stumped me yet. If they said break down, install the database, that's a little bit harder. Yeah, I can, might break it down a little bit, but it doesn't make nearly as much sense. But workflows, I can usually break down because these can continue to break down almost to infinity and beyond, right? So it really works there to do that kind of near-term backlog until it fits into the distributed team sprint. Even if that should be gets down to one person, we might have to break it down to something really, really, really small. The, so what do we covered here, right? So what our goal here is to remember as we break it down, we're gonna get to the sub, 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 or the sub, sub, sub step, right? We're gonna have to break it down so it fits to my distributed team. But remember, we've had this discussion as a team about what this berry level thing and then the value path is. So our goal is always to be within the context of that thing. And that's why that top level discussion is so important. If you're trying to work with distributed user stories, we're gonna use this as a way to say, how do we break down the work small enough so that as a overall berry, we can deliver this thing. Okay. Right. So that's what that's that's the whole strategy here. So the strategy is saying how your stories can help support distributed work is going to say we're going to first of all see what level get this level down really really tight here so that we, we can then break it down to something small enough that that distributed team can work on. And remember, we're going to start stop treating the user stories as a spec and start treating them as a work organizational tool. 
what they were meant to be in the beginning so that we can actually then organize it for the kind of work that we're doing. So let's see if we can digest that a little bit and see what we've come up with overall. So what are my key points here? Well, my first key point is that stories of interaction function perform in an acceptable way. What I'm talking about here is that we really need these stories as interactions, not as entries in JIRA or Azure DevOps for our distributed team, because the story is more than that. It's not just as a I can. That's just the description. We're going to start thinking about this whole interaction that is really going on very well here and make sure people understand that. So first key point, you've got to really start pulling back from the solution stories and start talking about these stories of interaction. The second key point is clarity at the very and value path level really empowers independent work. If you do not understand why you're building this, this makes it really hard. I was working with a team uh, a year or so ago, and they were sending user stories to an outsourced team. They were in uh, Arizona. The other team was in the Ukraine, and they were sending user stories as they I can. And they even sent the original code. They said, because they really, the goal was, you know, let me just map this out because it's kind of interesting in a way. What it was happening was that they were sitting uh, in Arizona. So we'll put a little place over here. And over here was Ukraine over here. And they had a device. And they said, here, here's all the code. You could have the original code. And here are user stories. And what we want you to do is to rewrite that code. Wow, my handwriting is really sucky. Sorry about that. And what they got back, we'll write the back line here, was junk. And they got back junk because user stories by themselves are user stories friends here, right? These user stories by themselves, even with the code, didn't understand what the heck they were building. They didn't know why they were building it. So what I had them do is I had them add yet a third uh, thing here. And we used use cases. Not user stories, but use cases, because use cases give context. And I said, you need to give context to use case because we need to tell about uh, the users and all this kind of stuff. And when they started using use cases, what they discovered is they actually started getting good stuff. Right? Because without that berry, without that context, without the thing going around of it, user stories are insufficient to get what you really want to get. So our second key point here is clarity at the berry and value path level really empowers that independent work. Third thing is that functions can decompose as far as we need to go. And this actually uh, was a fun thing back in the day when I was first learning functional decomposition because we used to break things down and get arguments about the best way to break it down. There is no best way to break it down. It just breaks down. And here's where two different people might break it down differently. If I said, uh, get bread, insert bread, heat bread, remove bread, someone else might break it down just, just to insert bread, heat bread, and remove the other two steps. Yeah, that could work maybe, right? And they include the getting bread as a step of inserting bread as they break it down to another level. I could live with that. There isn't one way to break it down, but it can break down. That's the key thing here because we're talking about that interaction, that function, those can break down into things small enough that we can put them to our distributed team that easily fit in their sprint. And finally, as we work to meet that value path, right, it's, that's what our goal is. Our goal is never just to complete the story that fits in the sprint because the story that fits in the sprint is like my entering the pin number. Entering my pin is not my goal of going to the cash machine. My goal of going to the cash machine is to sort of say, gosh, I want to get money. And so when I'm working on that pin, I've always got to keep my eye out here on that overall value path and the overall berry to say, ah, that's what I'm really trying to achieve here. So those are my key points. This is what I think it means to start saying, can we use user stories to decompose? Because if we have user stories to decompose, then we can start saying, boy, I can get them small enough to easily fit in somebody's sprint. So that's my story here. How we go about having those conversations, particularly from the product owner's perspective, is what I want to talk about on Thursday. But I wanted to give you some idea here saying we can rethink about user stories 
as vehicles to help me organize work as opposed to trying to be the specification of how I tell them how to do work. And tomorrow on Thursday, I'll talk about how we have those conversations that use these placeholders, right? These user story placeholders to drive that forward. So it's time to go look at the Q&A board here and see what we're going on. Ah, so I'm looking at my, my Q&A board over here. So one question I have is, what, say a couple more words about this berry thing, all right? And um, I'm sure I'm happy to do that. So I'm going to jump over here for a second and just say a thing about the berry thing here. So berry, we saw it was beginning. There's probably two ends in there. Uh, and reason for interaction. It really comes out to this idea of a transaction. If I have my black box of magic here and I'm a user, I say, I want something from you and then you give something back to me. That's the idea of a transaction. How you go about doing it, I don't care. And really, and that's the beginning and part of this thing, right? So if I just change code, that's the idea, the beginning of interaction. It has, I send something, I get something back and that's why I want to interact with you. And that, so when you think about a berry, you always want to think about this again being a the black box because once you start talking about inside of it, you're trying to get your you're, you're getting away from Barry Land a little bit. So if for my iPhone, if my iPhone was the black box of music, right? It's an old one, still has the little finger thing on here. What's something I want to do with it? Well, as a human, I want to say I want to play a game, right? And so it will come back and say, here's your game and I'll play and then we'll have lots of interaction and we can break this down to smaller and smaller steps how to play a game. But that's why I want to interact with the iPhone. Or I want to make a call, All right? I want to go talk to somebody, right? That's what I want to do with this device. That's the interaction I want to have. And there might, there's lots of subsets we could talk about doing that, but the sub-step isn't the reason I want to pick up my phone. The sub-step is just a step I need to take. And that's what Barry talks about. It says, I want to make a call. Now, how many ways can I make a call? Well, I can make a call via the phone app. I can make a call via the Teams app. I can make a call for, versus my VOP app. And so each way I can do that would be one of those pathways that I call a value path just because your one way achieves the value of that Barry. And that's the idea there. So um, I have a lot more to say about this in my on-demand class on Agile requirements, if you're interested in that. But that's one of the things going on here. Uh, another question, let me read this one out. Uh, what suggestions do you have for stories and decomposition of batch agent application or ETL apps, like a console app that gets a file by FTP, parses, transforms, and then search data to some other system? Yeah, not a problem here. Let me go back to my doodle board. So instead of being um, a human being or a phone, what I got here now is, uh, let's say it's a console, right? And over here is a sensor, right? So I'm building the console app. So I interact with a sensor. Uh, I interact, interact with an FTP a server out there, right? So I've got to think about what are their interactions with me, right? I want to send a file. Right? which I could have done by courier, I could do by electronic bits, but here I'm using an FTP server. And then what are all the steps of setting that file? How I go about transforming what I do with it once they get in there. And maybe what I do in here is I want to get that all then turns over here to some sort of other uh, a piece of equipment, a machinery over here. We'll draw the bug bug. And so based upon the sensor here and the FTP server, this piece of machinery does something else. And then it wants to, uh, no command or something. We'll do commands over here, All right? That's what I want to send it. So you have to look at each of these interactions and then start talking about the interactions going down about how they work. I'm currently working closely with a medical device company in Europe who has a very com, com not super complex, but it's very complicated device that helps us test for diseases. Right, and so when they're thinking about, they're thinking about their value paths here, and their value paths are things like the lab technician wants to run a test, and we can break that down to lots of steps. 
and they're seeing how freeing themselves up from what their machine currently does to what the lab tech wants to do is freeing them start saying, hey, I can see how I can build slices of things, make it really small so I can deliver value in small steps, but even decompose it because they're spreading out all over the place as well. So the first step in any of this is to start just sort of draw a box and say, what have you asked me to build? Right, because once you understand what you've asked me to build, then I start saying, this thing I'm building, who interacts with it? And so I start seeing all the different things around here that interact with it. And this is classically called a context diagram. And if you're asked to build a console app, or if you're asked to build an FTP server, that's what your black box is. And your interactions are around that. Now, you may be part of a larger project that has other things, but if you have your own backlog, right? Because what we're saying, a backlog should be filled in this thing, right? Should be focused on that's the product. And all the things on the backlog describe these interactions out here. That is the nirvana that you're trying to go for. Too often, what we see, of course, in that backlog back there is solution things that say how to actually build this as opposed to say what are the interactions are that we need to solve for. And that's where things start to go off the rails a little bit. So thank you. That is a, a, a really good question. So any other questions? Uh, uh, any other questions you have, feel free to drop us a line at Constructs. Uh, one of the places you can get us at is the hello.constructs.com or my own email address at earl.bd at constructs.com. So I, I hope you in, enjoyed this one. Thursday, I'll have a lot more to say about the conversations themselves. But until then, uh, keep your head down, stay in contact with your coworkers, and stay healthy. Uh, thank you very much.